today is going to be about Hearst, uh, but not just about Hearst, but about a little bit about the background about how Hearst came about and some of the processes involved in coming up with a, a law or a ruling as bad as Hearst. Yeah. Even if the Hearst fix goes through, uh, one of the things that concerns me is some of the processes that uh, led to Hearst coming about are still going to be in place. And so uh, I want to give people a little bit of at least my perspective about that and also uh, tell you some things about Hearst that. Okay. I'll try to speak up. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Uh, give you a little bit more perspective on um, exactly what uh, what some of the background is on Hearst in terms of court rulings and, and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. Is that okay? I'm looking for it. I'll eat it. There we go. <laughs> um, so, yes. No water for you. So the, the water Nazis have come to town. Let's see if it works. Which button? The arrow, the arrow up there now. Thank you, sir. It works. I'm hitting the arrow up. Show you. I can do it without the slides, but there's a couple of slides in particular. You know, I usually start off by asking how many people have heard about Hearst, but I'm sure everybody here has heard about Hearst. So, but let, let me go over some of the, the legal decisions that led up to Hearst, because Hearst, uh, at least uh, from my perspective, weaponized a few other Supreme Court decisions, and it's the sum total of these Supreme Court decisions which have led to the mess that we're in now. So, Hearst happened in uh, 2016, but before that, there was a ruling um, that's often called Foster. Uh, and that happened in 2015. Has anybody heard about Foster? How, show of hands, how many people have heard about Foster? Okay, we'll go over each of these, just curious. Um, then there was Postuma, which happened in 2000. How many people have heard about Postuma? Okay, about similar now. And um, uh, the Swinomish decision. So Swinomish versus ecology. Um, people heard about that. Okay, we'll go over each of these. So um, Hearst, as folks probably know, basically put water planning back into the GMA, or not back into the GMA, but into the GMA and made it a local county concern. Um, prior to that though, uh, let's go back to Postuma, which happened in 2000. Um, Postuma was a dispute between two sets of data that uh, came before the Supreme Court. It was a dispute between some actual data that somebody had where um, the effect of uh, water withdrawal could not be measured in actuality. And ecology had modeled that situation and their model showed that there was a theoretical effect on streams in the area. And so this went before the Supreme Court. Ecology argued that their model data was superior in quality to the actual data. So even though they couldn't actually measure it, there was a, a, a theoretical effect. And Postman was very damaging because the Supreme Court decided that uh, the model data by ecology was better in quality, so they sided with that. So ecology has interpreted the Postman decision to mean that any effect, even if it can't be measured, uh, has to be stopped. So uh, what became a dispute basically between two data sets has been interpreted by ecology to mean uh, even one molecule effect on any kind of stream or, or any senior water right is illegal. There's no de minimis. So Postman was really damaging for perspective. By the way, if you have any questions or anything like that, I don't mind if you, you ask, you know, raise your hand or anything like that, because this is a kind of a complicated topic. So that's Postman. Now, uh, Foster was an interesting decision because Foster said that any withdrawal from a stream, and by the way, I should back up a step, much of the Hearst decision is ultimately founded not on these four decisions, but way back when during in-stream flows. So in-stream flows, People know about in-stream flows? Okay. In-stream flows uh, was the, the, uh, the, the process, basically, of getting streams water rights. So the Nooksack has a certain in-stream flow set by ecology, and uh, we can't go below that, or ecology says we can't go below that. So any theoretical impact with Postman on a closed stream it is now illegal. So in-stream flows are kind of the starting point for the reign of terror that led up to Hearst. So we've got Postman, which says that 
no even model molecular effect on instrument flows is legal. And then we've got Foster, which says that any withdrawal from a stream uh, has to be replaced in kind, in, in kind, and in place. So it's in kind, in time, and in place. So if you take water out in July, you have to put water back in July in the same place. Of course, if you're taking water out in July, how can you put it back? So this, this, this combination of Postuma and Foster puts you in a straitjacket where you basically can't take any water out of the ground that might be uh, modeled in some way to be affecting the stream. And even if you do take water out of the stream, you've got to put it back in kind, in time, in place. And then the, the next decision, you know, there, there was this argument that was being taken um, that um, domestic use of water, even though there might be an effect on stream, was an overriding concern of the public interest, that it was in the public interest to let people use water. Well, the Swinomish decision put an end to that because the Swinomish decision said that domestic use of water was not an overriding concern of the public interest. So, uh, it, it again was sort of another uh, nail in the coffin to being able to use water. So those three decisions, plus the in-stream flow rule, uh, led up to Hearst, and then when Hearst put, put the, uh, the onus back on, on uh, planning into the GMA, these other decisions essentially completed the straitjacket and kept us in the situation that we're in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, <laughs> but yeah, it's <laughs> You know, and with respect to the process, there's this term, I don't know if anybody's heard it, I'm sure a few of you have, it, but that's been popularized by the Competitive Enterprise Institute called regulatory dark matter. Anybody ever heard of it? Regulatory dark matter. It's this process where the administrative state is able to sort of make laws that could never have been passed by legislatures. And the process um, that Hearst followed is kind of similar, right? Uh, how many legislators are there in the state? I don't know how many, right? It, at the end of the day, at least now, from my perspective, it comes down to the Supreme Court, there are only nine, right? There are nine legislators making laws. So what happens, uh, uh, you know, according to uh, some folks who have, uh, you know, postulated this regulatory dark matter, is that the legislature passes laws. Uh, those laws are interpreted by the administrative state, the executive agencies, uh, and regulations are written uh, to those laws, often which, you know, really, uh, are vague or don't really follow the intent of the original legislation. Uh, a friendly litigant plaintiff will come in and litigate those regulations, and the Supreme Court or the courts will decide something that the legislature never intended in the first place. And I think that's what's happened with Hearst, that's what's happened with a lot of things. And then the legislature is put in the position of trying to fix it. But it's very difficult to fix something um, because of the kind of the divided nature of politics and things like that. So, uh, and, and my concern, even with a fix, is that the same process will be repeated. Is that a fix will be passed, the executive agencies will interpret it with regulation, which will lead to litigation. So it's this continuous sort of grinding out of law being made by the courts because of uh, uh, the administrative making regulations. Yeah, question? What was the vote count in the... In the first, in the first decision? Yeah. I can't, I can't actually remember. Six, 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 I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Six, three? Yeah. I remember because I, uh, yeah, I six, I believe. And some of the dissents were, were great. Yeah. Stevens, I believe, had a great dissent, uh, essentially saying that you know, he didn't know what plain language meant anymore. So, uh, and it's, uh, the, the Supreme Court is really the, the folks making the law these days. So I, what I want to do is show you how ecology, you know, flat out lies in interpreting uh, some of these court decisions and um, the, the technical lies that go on when they try to describe how streams work and water flow and things like that. So I'm going to show you and run through quickly some presentations uh, that ecology gives to try to point you and point out exactly where they lie. What will happen is that they'll give you a 30 minute presentation, right? And it's all them telling you about the straitjacket you're in and how you can't do anything. 
And the technical lies buried somewhere in like slide 32, 40 minutes into the presentation. So I'll try to point out exactly where that is. First of all, I want to show you a little very short GIF or movie, which shows um, what in-stream flow is supposed to be protected. In-stream flows are supposed to protect base flows, what's called base flows in streams, which are geologic terms for uh, the minimum amount of flow that you find naturally in a stream. It's the, it's the water that's in a stream when there's no precipitation, none. It's often called drought flow. Now this has been reinterpreted by ecology to mean the minimum amount of water needed for fish. The two have no relationship. One is sort of a geologic term, one is sort of a biological opinion about how much water is needed for a stream regardless of whether or not that water is there in the first place. Let me show you what base flow should be. this is showing is the effect of rainfall on a stream and the little player is kind of uh, hiding it but there's there's a base flow in a stream and streams are continuous with groundwater uh, what happens is when there's a storm uh, the, the water from the storm percolates into the ground some of it runs off over the ground into the stream and some of it runs off into the ground and into the groundwater and raises the groundwater table um, uh, uh, ecology in many of their presentations is confusing the the, 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 the the amount contributed by groundwater to a stream with the amount that's contributed by overland storm flow to a stream and, and that's that's causing problems but but base flow is that minimum amount right there where there's no no uh, contribution from precipitation that's what's supposed to be protected but that's not what ecology is protecting and that's where the fundamental why is And here what they've identified is 
the, 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 the lowest flow, or uh, the red line basically, is uh, sort of the 10th percentile. In other words, um, only 10% of flows are below the red line, and the, the, the purple line is the, the median, and then they have that bright blue line, which is the 90%. So basically a high, median, and low um, flow regime for things. Keep going. That's all they've done. That's basically the same thing with the original data taken away. And more uh, stuff. Keep going. And then, that's the interesting part. And then they go away from that. And then they talk about other stuff. But let's come back to that graph. Keep flipping. Keep flipping. Keep flipping. I don't know. Hand waving, hand waving, hand waving. Hand waving. Go ahead. All right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Here. This is essentially the same thing, but with a different stream. Again, red is low flow. Not exactly zero flow. Those are years where precipitation is low, but not necessarily zero. It's really low. Um, the purple is the median, and the bright blue line is uh, the 90th percentile. They put in this dashed green line with the sort of sharp angles in it. That's what some biologists think fish need to live in that stream. And the slides that we skipped over kind of go over uh, how they came up with that line. But basically, it's just somebody's opinion. You know, how, how deep should the water be here in order to support a salmon? Not whether or not there's water, or whether there's water in that stream to begin with, or not whether or not the, the, the flow is natural, but what some biologist thinks is the requirement for fish in that stream. And they take that line, and they intersect it with the other lines, and that's how they determine what the minimum flow is required. So, um, often these flows will be set Keep going. Keep going. Okay. So, um, often these flows will be set at something other than the lowest flow. It'll be set at the median. It'll be set at something higher. Um, and and this has happened, for instance, in Nooksack, where the, the, the in-stream flow requirement was set at something like the close to the median, uh, 50%, which means that 50% of the time, naturally, right, Water is below that flow and above that flow. And, and uh, e e even so, even if you consider that variation, most of the flow variation is due not to groundwater, but to precipitation coming in out. Uh, but you'll get ecology setting in stream flows at something like the median. And then, uh, you know, uh, Gene Milius will write to ecology and say, oh my God, flows aren't met in the nook stack 50% of the time. Well, that is exactly how you set it. So they will be set at the median, which means that flows are not supposed to be above, or are, are not being met 50% of the time. And that's, then that's how the lawsuit is invited, because uh, streams aren't closed, or uh, streams should be closed, because the in-stream flow that some fish biologists have decided is necessary, even though it's the natural flow, is not, not, is not enough. So th does that make sense? It's all kind of a game with these, these numbers. Yeah, Doug. It's really quick, that, that red line, is that? That should be, you know, it's it's a historical compilation of flows, but you know, by and large, it should be uh, natural flows. These should all be natural flows. Yeah. So, who was the fish biologist that was deemed to be the expert to set that as the minimum? No, that's a great question because you will get fish biologists establishing what base flow is, which base flow being a geological, hydrogeologic which is, you know, basically like a chiropractor giving you heart advice. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's just some biologists in the um, in, in, in ecology. And in fact, the fellow who gave this, this was given at the Bellingham Library a couple of years ago or so. They had the, the biologist there. They're never up front and center. The guy who always gives this talk is uh, Christensen. Dan or Dave, I can't remember his first name. Dan or Dave. He's a high he's Dave. He's a, a, a hydrogeologist or sort of a regulatory expert. He's the one who always gives this. Um, and the fish biologists are kind of never around except maybe as props every once in a while. But those are the guys who establish the intersection of the curves. Yeah. I have a very specific question. I live on property on the Mount Baker Highway adjacent to the North Fork uh, of the Nooksack River. Mm -hmm. On that section of land I control, I have a drainage ditch that they put in in 1937 giving the Department of Transportation permission to drain the hillside on the opposite side 
through my property that I bought. It has a, about a five foot drainage tile underneath the Mount Baker Highway. I have the Department of Natural Resources coming on without consent on my property, and I have the Department of Ecology coming on my property without consent to investigate the drainage ditch, which now salmon come up on occasion. The salmon come up there because I protect the property and there's no intruders on my property unless I greet them in an aggressive manner. And these individuals from the state and the federal government think they can come onto my property to investigate a drainage ditch which they claim is a salmon spawning stream. Unfortunately, it's dry six months out of the year or four months out of the year. There is nothing but gravel in it. How can it have a baseline for salmon flow or any water? Well, it's, you know, there's a great ruling by Scalia. Yeah, really, he, Scalia was such a great writer. And um, the, the name of the ruling is slipping me out. But, but in that ruling, Scalia wrote what was um, Waters of the United States and what was um, Rapanos. Thank you. In the Rapanos decision, Scalia wrote just, a, 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 the guy got it. He just understood. In Rapanos, he wrote a description of what are natural waters of the United States and what are point sources, where he goes over sort of exactly your situation. Ditches cannot be receiving waters. They cannot be. <laughs> And um, can I uh, kick them off? Yeah. Well, from my perspective, I'm not a lawyer, but from my perspective, I sure would. Yeah, absolutely. And they 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 they, they, they do not have any um, sort of habitat jurisdiction over ditches. That's for sure. And you know, much of I think the entire GMA basically was invented to turn everything into habitat. Because salmon come up. Yeah. Does not make it anything no. less than a drainage ditch. It's still a ditch, it's whether still salmon a ditch. or not. Exactly. I it's can't. you can't have. You know, the, as Scalia wrote, he said, uh, there, there can't be, um, a, you know, a point source is any kind of conveyance, a ditch, a pipe, something like that, whereas receiving waters are sort of natural waters. And as Scalia wrote in Rapanos, uh, there can't be any significant overlap. Otherwise, the uh, whole idea of a discharge makes no sense, right? So ditches, the, the, the ditches have to be regulated as discharge points into receiving waters. They can't be receiving waters themselves. So, they, uh, anyway, they, they can't. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, actually, you know that, that that's absolutely true, and the in-stream flow uh, rules are supposed to be um, pertinent or pertain only. They only have jurisdiction over perennial streams. Perennial streams are streams that have uh, water in them, uh, groundwater contribution from them all year round. So a stream that partially goes dry for the year is a seasonal stream. A stream which contains only uh, storm flow and no is never in contact with groundwater is an ephemeral stream. And um, the in-stream flow rules are not supposed to pertain to seasonal or ephemeral streams, only to perennial. But what I see is because of the way the fish biologists identify the amount of water that should be in a stream, they, they, they look at seasonal streams and they say, oh, well, there should be water in there. So they're sort of creeping into jurisdiction of seasonal streams by saying, well, there may not be water, but there should be water in there. And you look at the maps of the, the, uh, 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 of the, of the streams that have been closed, and there's this general progression uh, of streams as you go from higher to lower as elevations that in the higher elevations they're generally ephemeral and then they become seasonal because there's slight contact with groundwater but as you get lower and lower down in the valley you have more and more contact with groundwater and so there is this kind of uh, geometric pattern of ephemeral seasonal to um, perennial streams really perennial streams should only be the ones in the river valleys not the ones up top but you look at the ones that have been closed and it's all those kind of there's a lot of middle, middle ones. I mean, you look at it, it looks like a map that you see in hydrogeology class of seasonal streams, because that's where they, they creeped jurisdiction over seasonal streams by saying they should have water in them, even though they don't. Uh, why don't you just look through the rest of those, so, just so we can see. Do fish really need water? Yeah. And, and, and they get so sort of condescending. Do fish need water? Yeah, of course they need water, but that's not the point. Anyway, keep going. That's it. Okay, good. But anyway, that's really the, the only important slides are the ones where the fish biologist intersects the stream flow and he, he makes it higher than what the red line is. And that, that's what they always do. They always make it 
um, the median or even higher. I've seen some in-stream flow rules uh, set at you know something like 70 or 80 percent. I mean that means that 70 or 80 percent of the time, naturally, the flow is not met, um, and yet they, they still think there's a, a, a it's a manufactured water drought basically. It's manufactured. So I'll just end with that. That's really the end of my presentation. I hope, uh, hope some of it made sense. But yeah, you, 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 I mean, it, I went to the Bellingham City Council when they were talking about this. I met you there, and it, it, it's just surreal to hear a guy with an Australian accent uh, talk about how Washington, Western Washington has a drought problem. Right? I know it's him well. surreal to hear a guy with an Indian accent talk about population problems <laughs> in Western Washington. Uh, but you know, they have. I, from my perspective, just completely manufactured uh, a crisis and a drought where there there is none. And you know, this is uh, uh, you know a saying by Milton Friedman, who uh, yeah. one of my favorites. You know, put the put the government in charge of the Sahara, and uh, there'll be a sand shortage in five years. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah, questions? The litigants again in the Hearst decision. Who was the litigant? Where did they get the money? Uh, it's it's a big, it's basically futurized. Hearst's name is kind of front front and foremost, but it's basically futurized. So. Good question. I mean, uh, the Bullock Foundation lives that. I mean, I don't, I don't know specifically. Somebody know? I mean, I just had a question on the original Postuma decision. Did the ecology model take into consideration the fate of the water? No. I mean, um, this, if, uh, I don't want to jump to conclusions about what your question is, but no, it didn't. I mean, uh, what is often brought up as um, a defense, which Postuma shoots down, is the fact that. Um, a lot of the water used for uh, residences and domestic use is returned to the water table. You know, when, when we do groundwater models, we usually model 85 or 90 percent return, return flow back. Still more than one molecule, and that's what Postman said. He said you can't even have one molecule effect. Uh, well, let me clarify that. That is how ecology is interpreting Postman. When you read Postman, it does not say anything about one molecule. It does not say anything about no demand. It does not say any of that, but that's how ecology is interpreting it. Absolutely, it's going right, right back in. Yeah, you know. well, well, and, well, I mean, that's right. There's, there's an argument that a friend of mine makes, and I think it's true that you know, to the extent that um, your aquifer, your, your well taps into deeper aquifers and brings it up, it's actually probably adding to the water table. Um, and I think that's that's probably true. You know, I, I, I sat and, and gave testimony in front of the legislature with a bunch of other um, geologists and hydrogeologists, and I simply could not believe some of the things like guys from the USGS were saying. They were saying, uh, there's one uh, PhD from uh, the USGS who was uh, just adamant that any amount of water taken from any aquifer anywhere must affect a stream. It's just crazy. Yeah. That was a year, so those were yearly flows. So, yeah. From, from what period of time? Oh, you know. Back, okay, back. Let's back up for a second. Yeah. Everybody's concerned about global change. Mm -hmm. Now, as a geologist, you think in long terms. Right. So, are we talking about a little few years, a decade, a hundred years? On yeah. On the slide, it said 1948 to 1954. Exactly. It's just, it's, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of places, Ellen points this out, a lot, a lot of the times these stream gauges are you know, few and far between. So the data quality, you know, even if you're just sort of, uh, except prima facie that the, 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 the analysis is right, right, the data quality itself is pretty bad. Yeah. I've seen some of these just be what they call snapshots, where they go out with the staff and they take a measurement on one day. On one day they take a measurement. Now, if it's not a rainy day, it's it's going to be 
one thing. If it was raining, it would be something. And they take snapshots and then they model. My question was, if there's water in the river, if there's water in the river, is there, there must be water in the ground. Is that a safe guess? Is there water in the ground? Because some of this groundwater shortage thing it has come into play. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, especially during the dry months, yeah, I mean, when you walk by a river or a stream in the dry months and you see water in it, you're seeing groundwater. That's what that is, because there's nothing else, right? So you're seeing groundwater. So if you're seeing water in a stream, there's... There's groundwater. There's groundwater. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems to me like the crux of the issue really is in the which was a historical compilation, as you said, morphs into a minimum. I mean, I, that's exactly right. So if it's if it's set as a median, it should be treated as a median. median if it's set as a, if you're going to treat it as a minimum, then you even go below the red line. You go to the absolute driest year you can possibly find. So yeah, that's right. It needs to be so, treated as so it's set. To follow up with that then, either, and, and my guess is that the, there isn't a specific point in time where it morphed from one to the other. It's a, it was a gradual process by whatever fish biologist or whatever. Hey, yeah. I'm not so sure it was gradual, but it was, but, but that's it, just but, the way it's always so been. So what, has there, was there a specific decision or written documentation that said, okay, now this is the minimum, like this median now is the minimum? No. Uh, so what, what'll what happen, so I, I brought this up with Christensen a couple times, I've argued with him about that, because I will say, you know, that's not baseball, what are you doing? And I'll say, we're allowed to set the minimum flows necessary for recreation. Yeah, okay, you're allowed to set the minimum flows necessary for rate if it's there in the first place. You know, but he is just adamant that the wording is, one of the sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, loopholes or whatever, it is, is that um, the, the in-stream flow and exactly what the in-stream flow is protecting um, uses different language in different parts of the code and different parts of the regulation. So one place it says base flow. One says it says the minimum flow is necessary for blah, blah, blah. Another place it says something else, um, and it's that, um, and, and, and when you line those definitions up, they're talking about totally different things. It's as if they define horse to be a horse in one place, and they define it to be a car in another place, and they define it to be a truck someplace else, and when you go to argue with these guys about, that's not a horse, it's supposed to be a horse, they'll say, well, this one here says it's a car, I can, I can tell a car. So, so if you go to them and argue with them about base flows, it's supposed to predict base flows. Here's the, here's the citation. They'll say, well, this place right here allows me to set minimum flows necessary to protect recreation and wildlife and everything else, and so that's what I'm setting. And so it allows them the logic to um, set flows that have that are purely habitat-based and not, not based on geology at all. So that allows them to jump from one to the other. Correct. So is that something that, from a legislative standpoint, that the legislators think could, uh, could look at that specific point. They, they absolutely could. A concern I have about a fix, I mean, last time I saw the fix, it was 22 pages long. And yeah. I look at 22 pages and I think, oh my god, I called you have a field day with 22 pages. <laughs> so uh, instead of fixing one word or just saying, you know, the in-stream flow rules hereby repealed. Now, you know, that, I, I'm not a politician, so that may be totally politically infeasible. But that's what I get afraid of when I see a 22-page fix. Yeah. Yeah, so what I was thinking about is that the Found people sort of try to be too practical about this. Uh, 
how do I fix this? How do I do it? Well, there's no problem in the first, there's no problem to begin with. So you don't have to fix anything. You just kind of have to figure out the scheme and the game and what's going on, the shell game going on. And from my perspective, it's all about money. So will that be acceptable? It sounds like it should be acceptable, but nobody's earning any money off of it, so it probably won't be. <laughs> Got a question over here? Yeah. Water gets into a stream by virtue of two or three different methods, either instant precipitation that's falling on the stream, or runoff from snowpack, or the runoff from instant precipitation elsewhere. Mm -hmm. To some degree, we've been led to believe that there's this absolute relationship between groundwater and river water. Now, my well's 101 feet deep. That's deeper than any part of the nutsack. Mm -hmm. yes, to I what degree can you indicate the relationship between groundwater and flowing water in the stream? Yeah, you know, it's really uh, site specific, you know, and, and that's another thing because you may have uh, losing streams. You know, you, you, the nutsack in the lower part may be a losing stream part, mean, means groundwater is flowing away from the river. And unless you have sort of wells and a little bit of information, uh, that sort of quantify uh, what the groundwater gradient is and where the groundwater is flowing. It's 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 kind of hard to say. So you may be tapping into an aquifer which is you know different and isolated from but all except. around the county. It's going to, the groundwater is going to be at different levels. Uh, it, it is absolutely. All over the place. Well, and you know e even the uh, uh, Postman decision and, and other sorts of interpretations by ecology even are interpreted by ecology to mean that any hydraulic conductivity between groundwater and a stream. Uh, somehow takes water away from the stream. So even if the stream, even if the groundwater is flowing from the stream, away from the stream, to your well, and so you're actually just not affecting groundwater at all, you're just taking water that's, that's already leaked from the stream, they still establish that hydraulic conductivity as something that can't be you know, allowed. Yeah, but it's very site specific in the ground. And so the, 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 I have to say this, you know, because of the emphasis on modeling and everything else, so they have Chuck Lindsay and all these, you know, hydrogeologists, Developing models and you know this belief that uh, these models are going to save the county, and once the models are in place, we'll know exactly. That's a bunch of baloney. That's not going to happen. Mr. Ongles. I just wanted to talk about how easy it is to retain standing to uh, file a petition with the Earth Management Heritage Board about an issue like this, mm -hmm. and this one had its genesis in some testimony by Gene Milius to the county council mm -hmm. about the earlier petition concerning the rural element. Mm -hmm. And she said, in addition, under 3678.70, blah, blah, Whatcom County has not sufficiently protected water quantity and quality. And that's where this started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you have these bad technical interpretations, it's it's very easy to file a complaint about, you know, so, and, you know, Gene Melius and those folks are pretty wise to where the, the holes are. Wait. what you would take to the federal courts, uh, but... Uh, so if the Supreme Court makes a bad decision... Yeah, it's, it's law. Court, we're stuck. Exactly, we're stuck with it. We're stuck with it. It, it, it. Unless the legislature can reverse it, but like I say, I, I, I have a fear that every new fix uh, just creates a new sandbox for ecology to play in. So, so then your fix would be if we got rid of the DMV? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that would be a great fix. I mean, but, but generally, I'm sort of prone to that. Anything that repeals is a fix. Hey, stop adding to the code. You know, you have a bad law, you have, you have a bunch of code, and so how do you try to fix it? You try to add more code. It's like, oh, no, don't do that. Stop adding to the code. Anyway, yeah. Well, actually, I think this gentleman's been waiting patiently for him. Well, I, I wanted to comment on the, whoever asked about where the money comes from, where it comes from. They're granted from the state. No, that's a good point. The city, that's a very good point. The county is where we shop between the support. It's reading the newspaper and contributing to the newspaper. The 
all tie back into where these folks are getting their money. Yeah. So you need to nice. understand counts our money. That's a good point. Yes. Yes. Is it not true that current county councilman Todd Donovan is listed as one of the uh, four defendants? That, that's my understanding. Yep. Yep. That's my understanding. Uh, it. Yes. Uh, I'm from Skagit County. It was several years ago where I think the pilot project for Industry Floor will happen in Skagit County at Fisher Carpenter Creek. That got our commissioner's attention. Uh, they demanded that Ecology come and put a presentation on locally that filled the uh, McIntyre Hall. Uh, their spokesperson introduced on the dais with him uh, after the play meeting. He said the Department of Ecology has four licensed credential graduate hydrologists on staff. I have three of them with me today. Ed, you're a credentialed licensed hydrologist, geologist, economist. Why haven't these people had their licenses revoked for a oh, <laughs> You know, the geology board and I just don't get along. So I, I filed complaints after complaints. Me and you know, a friend of mine, Steve Newbenbauer, was somebody you know. We filed complaints so many times, and it's always whitewashed. It's always just. I, I have, you know, compared to, I practiced a lot in California, I'm also licensed in California. And California uh, actually goes, I mean, there's a lot you can say about California being crazy. <laughs> but California is actually fined uh, water richers, you know, water dowsers for illegally practicing hydrogeology. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, th there's this whole thing about whether or not professions should be licensed or anything, but certainly the Washington State Board has a very different viewpoint from the California State Board. They, they'll let anybody say anything about it. Yes. Just, uh, just for your information, I was really looked up at PDC. Eric Hurst just contributed to my opponent's campaign. Oh, <laughs> shot. Yes. rather than specific, but, uh, but I'm often told by my attorneys when we get to the Supreme Court, you know, it, you're not going to win on the science at the Supreme Court, you're going to win on law. And so, uh, you know, that always blows my mind, but that's what, that's what I get told by my attorneys when we take things to the Supreme Court. I've got a, court, I've got a case coming up uh, on Halloween, believe it or not. Yes? In the case of the Skagit River, why are the city's low harbor and ports not affected? They're drawing straight out of the river well, the direct answer to your question is I, I, I don't know, but, the, 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 but the, the, you bring up the same point that I had, is, you know, all these urban areas are against rural areas taking water out. Where do the rural areas, where do the urban areas think they get their water? So all the urban areas can take water out of the, basically take all the rural water, but the rural areas can't take the rural water. So, uh, I, you know, you could say that about Oak Harbor and Anacortes, but you could uh, say equally the same thing about Seattle or any place else. I mean, Yeah. Right. It's just I agree. Yeah. I completely agree. And then, you know that another, and another point a friend of mine brings up is that there's this uh, uh, there's also this assumption that all the groundwater sort of discharges to streams and there's no leakage directly to um, the ocean and there's a tremendous amount of direct leakage right right to the ocean. So uh, anyway, that's another sort of complication that nobody wants to talk about. Yes.
Chris. Solutions. I think a lot of the people that are here are looking for solutions. Um, what, I know you just talked about getting rid of the GMA, um, getting rid of or reviewing the in-stream flow, you know, having it uh, defined properly. How best to get that information, solutions, to our policymakers and to the public and get them it communicated and educated so that we get good policy and good law? Yeah, I mean, just getting the word out there. And I think the fix, whatever fix happens, the shorter the better. But um, this process is still going to go on. You know, Idaho has something on the books where the legislature, so, you know, the, the the legislative powers um, of the state are supposed to be embodied in the legislature, not in the executive agencies, not in the administrative state. And the only reason why they're able to make regulations is because at some point that was delegated to them. Um, but there's no reason why the legislature can't take that back. And so on the federal level, that was taken back uh, this year, at least a little bit for projects over a certain size by the Congressional Review Act. And Idaho also has something similar where the legislature gets to review regulations written by the executive agencies. It would be great if Washington could do that, and I just don't know if that's politically feasible, but, but yeah, Chris. And, and let's say that the legislator, it, legislative body in Washington State is not able to get their first fix in. What should the Washington County Council be doing to alleviate this? What did the, the Supreme Court ask them to do something? What should they do in order to make this so that they can start permitting? Yeah, well, uh, it asked them to start, uh, you know, all the Hearst decision did, but it didn't say you had to have more terms, it didn't say you had to do any of this, it didn't tell you to do anything. It just said you have to start sort of incorporating water planning into your GMA plan. Now, the Whatcom County Council seems to have taken an extremely, uh, you know, crazy point of view uh, and just put a moratorium on anything, it really hurt people. Um, and I don't think they had to do that. Uh, I think all they had to do was, um, you know, put some basic procedures in place saying that they are taking it you know, into consideration. Um, that, that would be my view, but folks, I don't know, Mary Kate, you want to comment about this or anything? Yes. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, one thing that has been talked about is rain catchment system. Yes. And if you go to Wapakoni, you'll say, oh, nothing's changed, you can still get a building plan, you just have to rain catchment. Yeah, but as Mary Kate yeah. pointed yeah, so out, things like that, you what can't get a mortgage, you can't get any of the stuff yeah, with rain catchment. There are two things you don't need a water right for, as far as I know. And by the way, often stormwater gets confused. This is back to your question. Often stormwater gets confused with uh, receiving waters. And, you know, a storm, and this Scalia also made this in the Rapanos decision. He said basically there's receiving waters and there's effluent. Okay, effluent is wastewater. It's regulated as wastewater. That's what stormwater is. When it gets into a ditch, that's not water. You don't need a water right to take water out of a ditch. You shouldn't, anyway, because it's not water. It's effluent. And uh, so there are a couple of things you don't need water rights for. One is you don't need water rights for effluent because it's not water. You don't need uh, water rights for diffused water at this stage, which are waters which have which are just kind of freely flowing over the ground. They haven't really reached uh, receiving waters yet. And you don't need uh, water right for uh, desal, for salt water. Uh, so uh, those are kind of the three areas that uh, may still be uh, open to folks. Uh, but. The basic science about, or sort of principle of taking water away from salmon, you know, that applies to rain catchment as much as anybody else. I don't know why somebody would, in principle, if they were concerned about the environment, be okay with water catchment but not taking water out of the ground. It's the same thing. Yes? I was going to say, I've heard that same thing. I've had some environmental people tell me that catchment, they can't wait. They're going to sue because you're dewatering the channel. Anything that stops the water from getting to the fish, they'll sue. Yeah. So I, I think I people are looking for that as a solution. Again, it's a situation where nobody's making any money off of it, so they got to make it illegal, right? So. Yeah. Yes. Personal uh, opinion is that uh, <coughs> saturated fishing is a hell of a lot more detrimental to the survival oh, yeah. of salmon. Sure. Yeah. Then any water issues which currently exist within this county. 
Yeah, I mean, we get all when, this attention, all this money is being directed at something that's not going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. The big thing we have to do is enforce offshore, and the state has to enforce all along our river. Yeah, that's right. Whether the fishermen are tribals or yeah. not. Yeah. Well, you, there's that experiment by Russ George a few years ago. Do people know who Russ George is? He got together with the Haida and he put the iron sulfate in the water. You, have you heard about that experiment? No. So, Russ George is a sort of controversial scientist, American scientist. Um, got a strong green background, actually. And uh, well, he looked at the um, volcanic eruptions in the Gulf of Alaska. And he kind of noticed that whenever there was a volcanic eruption, salmon um, populations exploded. And so he got the idea that the volcanoes were putting dust and other sort of nutrients in the ocean, which were causing phytoplankton to bloom, which was you know leading up the food chain and causing salmon. So he came up with this idea, well, why don't we just dump a bunch of iron sulfate in the ocean and see what happens? So they did that probably now about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. He got together, he got together with the Haida tribe up in Canada, Queen Charlotte Islands, and they dumped a million dollars worth of iron sulfate. And the following year, there was that enormous sockeye run on the Fraser River. So it looked like it worked. So what did they do? They tried to prosecute Russ George for ocean dumping. <laughs> um, but imagine if you could replace the entire salmon sort of economy and infrastructure, all the regulators, with a million bucks of iron sulfate uh, every year, and, and that the, uh, the, 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 the real problem. I have another friend who's a fisherman who, who um, has come up with this theory that he feels that the Clean Water Act is actually killing salmon, that it's too clean. He points to the Green River which is uh, the water source for Seattle. And uh, apparently they need, they take water out of that uh, and they hardly, hardly treat it. There's not a damn thing living in it. So um, he and a few other friends of mine, but he in particular, my fisherman friend, claimed that uh, when the water was dirtier, there were a lot more salmon around. Um, and so we're cleaning it up so much that they're just, we've, we've done something to the nutrient cycle, basically. And, and that's what's really leading to uh, degradation, not anything else. But the larceny in the heart of every fisherman is a real issue. Uh, I, I totally agree. This, this fisherman friend of mine, and he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He, he really, you know, he's a very good observer of things. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. Last said. question. You had to help. Is there anything written by you or anyone else that refutes all of this caca? That's coming out. Of no, I probably should. In fact, Dave, uh, we talked. Dave and I have talked on a time, a couple times about doing a primer or something like just something very short for people to digest. But no, I, I give testimony and things like that. But I've never actually written something and put it out there. But I probably should do that. That may help yes. to get that word out yeah. to more people. Yeah, that'd be great. It's a good idea. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Appreciate your. Uh, Thank you all for your attendance today. Put on your calendar to be here the second Wednesday next month for our candidate forum, and we are dismissed. <laughs>